good afternoon everybody and thank you for joining us for this webinar. Um, I was fortunate enough to have the chance to work with the Global Donor Platform to conduct this study looking at donor funded agribusiness projects. Uh, the purpose of the study was to get a better sense of what different donors are doing around the agribusiness and so this actually ties in rather nicely with the previous presentation about Canada and their commitment particularly around growth, you know that action area growth and women's empowerment as some of their two of their six pillars that they're working on. Um, so let's see what lessons there are specifically derived from this study. So the study actually worked with uh, eight different agencies and 16 projects to review what they were doing around gender in agribusiness. And so I've got three areas that I'm going to look at. First of all, looking at the conceptual framework. So these are the points of gender responsiveness, having a rating system and different domains of gender inequality, then applying that framework to the field level activities of the different projects, but also looking at the project management, because that seems to be a crucial part of how innovative the field level activities are, and that's the correlation between those two areas. And then finally, coming on to some recommendations and conclusions. So this is very familiar to most people. This is a bit like a gender marker, so I had uh, four areas that I was going to use as my kind of scoring system where we have gender blind or gender neutral where nothing much is happening to look around addressing gender issues. Uh, activities which I felt were like gender equitable, looking at leveling the playing field. So this is basically around improving women's access to inputs and services. Then the, the third thing level then was gender equality. So this is where there's much more effort taken and I think this is probably where most agencies try and work. So looking at broadening and deepening their inclusion, taking account of these structural barriers, social barriers, social norms, but not actually doing anything about it. Whereas what we are very interested in now is the gender transformative approaches where actually it's doing something different to overcome these social norms and barriers that really push out the envelope and really embrace women's inclusion. So it would be interesting to see, you know, in a couple of years time with the Canadian uh, policy, how much they've managed to move from levelling the playing field, approaching gender equality, to actually really changing these fundamental um, barriers to women's inclusion, because I think that's where the answer lies, because we're quite good at the top bit. We haven't yet had tons of success at the bottom bit, so this is what this study was about. Now, the other thing I did was I didn't want to just have one gender rating for a whole project, because in that we lose the diversity of different activities. So I looked at agribusiness initiatives and I reckon that there are eight different domains in which agribusiness projects typically work. So if we go from the top here of this octagon, we're looking at access and control over resources. So access to inputs, um, to financial services, to land. We're looking at developing women's skills and knowledge, um, access to information. Where they're moving around to improving their access to markets and new employment opportunities their voice and representation in self-help groups, in producer organizations, but also multi-stakeholder platforms looking at value chain governance. We're looking at workloads in terms of the domestic workload that has just been referred to, but then also the workload in and around the agricultural sector and off-farm work. And then the last three I think are really important, and this tends to be another area where we're um, tend not to be so active. So looking not just women as um, people outside the home and engaging in economic activities in the public sphere, but also looking at their role within the home. So I think this ties quite nicely in within the second action area of Canada, looking at um, human dignity and also the, the well-being and the quality of people's lives. So access to family planning or nutrition issues. Uh, freedoms to make decisions and things, and then also looking at the broader policy and institutional environment and context. So then for each project, I then classified all their different activities into one of these eight domains, but then I also then rated it according to the extent to which I felt it was being gender equitable, equality or transformative. So if you've had the chance to print out the two handouts that were attached to the most recent email um, notification about this webinar, there's a matrix and if you haven't got it then you can download it at a later time. But basically the matrix sets out the eight domains of gender inequality and then the three levels of gender responsiveness. And I've just given examples that I found during my read through all the different project documents which demonstrate how something might be equitable, it might be considered to be promoting equality 
or perhaps transformative. So for example, if we're looking at uh, skills and knowledge, you've got technical training for existing crops and livestock that women are normally doing. So okay, we're just helping them get better skills around what they're currently doing. So I would call that as equitable. Then we've got Moving on to equality, we've got training, coaching, mentoring services to develop skills in new areas or farming as a business, entrepreneurship, negotiation skills. So pushing that envelope out for women. And then finally, gender transformative approaches. This is where I really feel that projects have supported women as role models so that they're doing things differently in their community so other women can be inspired by their role um, to change the mindsets and to provide inspiration. So I would call that transformative. Now obviously where something is classified depends on the context. So in one cultural setting something might be equitable, in another cultural setting that same activity might actually be transformative because it's so, you know, it's a different cultural setting. And then obviously these things are complementary so it wasn't just one project doing one activity and often they were graduated so projects were pro providing a kind of ladders of opportunity for rural women. So having that kind of, um, mindset, then I then applied this uh, framework to projects. If we go on to the next slide, this gives the results of a review of 15 projects and their field level activities, looking at, and then along the horizontal axis here, we have the eight different domains, and then up the vertical axis, we've got the scores. And then we've got color coding, so it's really great for an online presentation, <laughs> so there's lots of things to look at. So basically, if we're looking at the overall eight, what really stands out on the right-hand side are the three areas of whether there were any activities in these projects to support women's role in household decision-making and controlling the benefits, you know, particularly income, whether there were any initiatives around well-being and the quality of life, and any initiatives on policy engagement. And the, the tall blue bar indicates that actually many projects did nothing in this area. So I would say, this is a big challenge to Canada now, is moving into this area, your action area two, looking at decision making, dignity, well-being and things, this really needs to be part of the growth agenda because we can't have, um, these things need to be integrated rather than separate. So it's interesting that there's very relatively little going on in that area. But if we look at the other five, I think this is where we talk about, bearing in mind I was looking at agribusiness projects, this is the meat of agribusiness projects. So getting women having access to resources, skills, market workloads, and voice and representation. And so the two areas that were most transformative with the red bars were ensuring women were having a voice, so belonging to producer groups, having voice in value chain stakeholder platforms very good and giving them much higher presence in value chain development and then also developing these skills and knowledge so having women as um, leaders and role models for others to follow. In the interest of time I'll move on of course this study is available online and there are some blogs also available so uh, there are different ways of following up. Now if you're if you're sitting in an organization that has a number of projects what's fun about this um, tool or approach is that you can use it to do inter-project comparisons and so here we've got the octagon with two different results of two different projects uh, plotted. I've taken two extremes just to demonstrate the methodology. Obviously, the bigger the area within the octagon, um, the better. And so we've got a project uh, that was a grant project uh, by FAO on working in Kenya and Rwanda, which was piloting different approaches to um, innovative work around agribusiness and uh, value chains. And so it really covered many of the areas. So you can see the red lines are kind of great in terms of uh, you know the basics, but then also pushing out on voice and representation, workloads and household decision making, and policy engagement. In contrast, there's a, a project in Moldova which was um, is through IFAD, which is pro was providing a you know very different in scale, 26 million dollar loan to government. So very much focusing on the technical aspects of ensuring women had the inputs and resources and the skills and the knowledge, but less um, rounded in terms of looking at some of these other dimensions of women's empowerment. If we move on to the next slide, we can say, then see what happened, because I thought that it was also interesting when the data were available to look at project management, because field level activities don't happen in isolation. So here I looked at five different dimensions of project management, going from whether there was gender strategies, theories of change, 
looking at staffing responsibility for gender and the presence of a gender specialist, the m and &E system, partners and their engagement in the gender agenda as well as, as, as service providers, and then also whether the project had got any procedures to make it more women friendly, accessible for the services accessible for women. The strong one here is, is very interestingly is monitoring and evaluation. And so I'd say most of the activities were looking at collecting and analysing sex disaggregated data, which I've put down as perhaps being gender equitable. Um, but it, in terms of being gender transformative, it was a few projects where they actually had looked at these different, the more qualitative aspects of women's empowerment. So not just counting women as beneficiaries and things, but going beyond that to say, well, what does it mean for the livelihoods of women, both in terms of their income, in terms of the quality of their life as well. So moving more to using things like the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index. The other area that was very strong was looking at gender strategies, and clearly that made a big difference. So if you have a good gender strategy which talks about the theories of change and what you're trying to achieve in the project and link that back to um, budget allocations, then those activities are transformative. And then the third area I'd like to pick out is the importance of partners and engaging with partners so that they don't just have women as part of the process of um, getting access to participating in the project, but they really understand the benefits of engaging with women as equal partners in value chain and agribusiness development. So putting that at the centre of engagement with partners and service providers. Now, this is, this is where it's kind of really interesting, so I was just playing around with the data sets I've got, and I thought, well, let's have a look at the relationship between the gender responsiveness of project management, which we've just seen, aggregating the different scores for, for a particular project, and then seeing that, is there anything relationship between project management and the gender transformative levels of activities um, at the field level? And so here again, we've got uh, the Kenya-Rwanda example with the FAO grant, which is a small you know, 3 million grant um, in a couple of countries. It, because it was kind of innovative and uh, playing, you know, exploring new ideas, it perhaps played less attention to the project management dimensions. Whereas if we look at Pakistan, this is a project supported by uh, Australian aid, they had a huge, very, very solid approach towards women's empowerment in the agribusiness initiatives. And this then translated into some very interesting work that they've been doing in Pakistan in the horticulture and dairy meat value chains. But what's interesting there is the different um, levels of field activities depended on the gender responsiveness of their partners. Now, in the horticultural value chain, which was in the more remote valleys, with smaller businesses, they found that uh, often the businesses were able to be more innovative than the bigger dairy and meat businesses down in the central area, where they perhaps were more reluctant to be very innovative around gender issues. And then here in the middle, what I've called C, we've got a solid range of projects, um, which include IFAD and DFID and the International Training Center, Training Center, um, the good field results supported by different levels of project management. And then the Moldova project, uh, which we talked about earlier, you know, reasonable project management, reasonable project out, um, field level activities. And it's interesting also to look at the context of this project, because out of all the countries that were included in the study, Moldova had the least Gen level of gender issues. So if I was looking at the Gender and Development Index or the um, SIGI, the Social Institutions and Gender Index of OECD, you know, the gender issues were at a much lower level than some of the other countries where they were much higher. So perhaps in terms of project management, it wasn't seen to be so high up on the agenda. So what are these drivers of the transformative agenda? Well, building on that last point, uh, perhaps looking at the difference between Moldova um, and the two different outcomes in Pakistan, it's looking at the project context. So where gender issues are high on the social agenda, if the partners are flexible, then you can have a more transformative agenda. Secondly, the commitment from the donors. So some donors, and I, it's always dangerous to name names, but then again, remember, this is a very small study, but the Australians, DFID, were really keen on gender. So for example, in a, one of the projects in, that's supported by DFID, they had a gender target, which was very challenging, but they didn't just see it as a target, 
Because they weren't going to deliver on the target, they then sent in additional technical support to actually rejig the project to make sure it delivered what it was expected to do on the gender outcomes. And I think this, is, again, is a method, message for Canada. It's great at design stage saying, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. But actually, it really needs to be pushed. So these aren't just kind of words on paper, but actually really wanting to do something differently. One or two projects had um, were really kind of in the private sector and the accreditation for fair trade and decent work was a push towards doing more, particularly around um, the more qualitative aspects. So having um, health programs, having education, having adult literacy classes. So that that is a tool that can be used to kind of make us more um, transformative. And then finally, the skills and the commitment of the project management so that it's not just the responsibility of the gender specialist within the project team, but all project staff are committed and accountable to deliver on gender issues. The same with the partners and service providers. They have to, they have to really get why the trends are transformative for gender makes a difference to their business. You know, it's not just enough to say it. They have to really believe in it and do things differently as a result. So th I think in terms of the challenges and the next steps, then it's looking at, so what are good entry points for engaging with women around agribusiness and value chains? So should we go into the niches where women are already are and try and strengthen that and use that as a platform to develop along um, value chains? Or should we pick up different areas and opportunities and launch into to that? So that's one consideration. Crucial is how to get this mindset shift about you know, growth, the women's economic empowerment in the context of agribusiness. How can we do things where people really get that it makes a difference by engaging with women as equal players in this uh, growing arena? As you said, uh, um, you, you know, the pie is getting bigger. Well, this is one area where the pie is getting bigger. And for the pie to deliver in terms of productivity, food security, we need to have women there fully facilitated as um, equal players. But also there's a role for the public sector. There's, there are things that it's perhaps not realistic for the private sector to pick up on. They, we can't expect them to pick up the whole tab. So for example, this, this is a bit about leveling the playing field. So if we're having, um, if we're working in areas where women have missed out on education opportunities, then perhaps literacy classes, perhaps basic, basic infrastructure around markets. You know, we need a role of government to support these public goods to complement the initiatives by the private sector. And then I think the final challenge is, you know, they're very good um, examples uh, of uh, innovation. Uh, so for example, we could take that FAO grant, but how do we take it to scale? So how do we get the good ideas from these little pockets of uh, good experiences into the much bigger substantial investments that are taken? Um, so how do we take those lessons across? So that, that's the end of my presentation. I'm sorry, it's, it's a gallop, but time is always against us. So the, there's, the, there's the full report, but there are three blogs that I've done for the Practitioner Hub. And I've also written this methodology up um, for the European Commission as a tool, which will also be available on their website. And of course, there, there's a chance for some questions at the end. So thank you very much for your time. My question goes to Claire. Um, in terms of and probably uh, you'll excuse me because I haven't probably had a chance to really look into the tools and how that relates into actual realities um, in terms of women, particularly the smallholder farmers and their struggles uh, in terms of securing tenure rights. Um, there is a recognition, of course, uh, a mention of resource uh, question um, in view of the tools and how that is equally important. Uh, how did you see that probably interacting in reality in terms of both at the household um, relations or uh, household uh, relations between the spouse or from a tenure point perspective. And this probably from the Canadian point of view um, in terms of the focus on goal five is the interface of the tenure security component under under goal one of the SDGs, that's tenure security indicator 1.4.2 under target 1.4 and how that interacts in reality because uh, the focus on agriculture, if uh, at all we we kind of not provide adequate also mention and support of women ownership as, as well as access and control of or having secure tenure rights, it will definitely be a big challenge. So what are the experiences, uh, both and maybe the interest to focus um, on agriculture, but also giving attention to securing tenure rights as it relates to those two goals? Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. In fact, I'm glad that you've come back to me because uh, about land, because I realised when I was just 
listening to the other presentations, I realised I hadn't highlighted it. So when, if, if you recall the matrix that I had about uh, looking at access, you know, the different domains of gender inequality in agribusiness and then the equity, equality and transformative approaches, land tenure is an, a, a transformative approach because it's such a big step. It's, it's, it, you know, it's a different thing from just having access to inputs or having access to kind of different types of credit lines and things. And so I think it's absolutely, it's kind of an indicator of things are happening differently uh, because of there's so much, um, you know, so many norms around expectations about women and access to land or the ownership of land being in the male domain and, you know, women's inability to inherit it and things. So I think it's a, it's a very good indicator of things that are moving ahead. I was only able to work with um, the data that I got from projects. And so I think the link between gender, the different levels of gender transformative approaches and the impacts was based around a few little examples of, um, you know, where I could find some evidence. So it wasn't, so I think if, if one was going to develop this tool, it would be taking, looking at the design, looking at implementation, but then correlating implement, you know, the range of activities that have taken place during project implementation with different types of qualitative indicators of impact would be very interesting. But with the data that I had that I didn't have the opportunity to do that. Um, and I guess that kind of comes back to Canada as well. How are you going yeah. to show that you've made this big transformative difference? So what, are you going to develop your own um, M&E tools and impact tools, or are you going to use the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index, or are you thinking of something um, different? I'm not sure, Evelyn, whether I really answered your question, but thank you very much for highlighting the importance of land tenure.